Welcome to Variations 4. This is the Neurological Unit. In this unit, we're going to be covering question number 4, number 5, and we'll cover uh, number 6 and 7 on the topics of ICP. So starting with question number 4, how might decreases in oxygen um, in the blood, PaO2, cause an increase in ICP. There's two ways. Let's talk about one of them first. If we decrease oxygen for whatever reason, by whatever mechanism, to any tissue, and in this case, the brain, as you know, what can happen is cellular death, ischemia. What do you know about injury to tissues? What does that cause? That causes inflammation. And what have we learned about inflammation so far in this course? Inflammation causes vasodilation in the region, causing fluids to be mobilized to that area, causing edema. If we have increased fluids flowing to the brain, edema forming in the brain, in the cranium, increased edema in the cranium, what do we end up with? Increased ICP. The secondary mechanism, which is very much related, is just in general, if you starve the brain of O2, as we said in the last question, cranial vessels dilate, allowing more blood to enter. And that in itself, that may help, you might get more O2, but you also may increase ICP by way of allowing more blood to flow in. And there you have the answers written out for question four, basically summarizing what I just said. So question number five asks us to look at the CPP equation. CPP is your cerebral perfusion pressure. Ultimately, that is what you want. You want organs to be perfused. And in this case, the king of all organs, arguably, is the brain. Close tie with the heart, I guess. But cerebral is about perfusion of the brain, cerebral perfusion pressure. What is cerebral perfusion pressure? It's MAP, which Honestly, for our purposes, you could think of MAP, mean arterial pressure, as the same as just blood pressure. I mean, MAP is calculated by way of taking your systolic and diastolic blood pressures and running it through a fairly fancy equation. You do not need to know that. You can think of mean arterial pressure for our purposes as the blood pressure reading that you get, okay? Um, that wouldn't be uh, too bad of a way to look at it. So. And ICP is what we just talked about. That is the intracranial pressure. And we already know the intracranial pressure at a normal range is zero to 50 millimeters of mercury. Let's take the patient um, at rest to make this easy for this first example and say that they're at zero millimeters of mercury. So they're at a healthy ICP. I mean, zero to 15 is healthy. When you sneeze, your ICP might go up to seven. Um, but let's just take zero to make the easy example. So if there's no pathophysiology happening, no pathological processes here, then ICP is zero, let's say. And guess what? The perfusion to the brain equals blood pressure. In other words, the blood pressure, you run the numbers through, you calculate your MAP, and it equals CPP, and everyone's happy. And that's kind of how you've been thinking about things up to now. You think to yourself, okay, if my patient's got 120 over 80 blood pressure, they must be getting decent brain perfusion. Because whether you've known it or not, you've, you've been going with the working assumption that there's no issues with ICP. But of course, today's topic is ICP. So now imagine the patient's got intracranial pressure beyond 50 millimeters of mercury. Imagine that they got hit in the head and they got a lot of edema going on. That's going to raise the ICP up. What's going to happen? Blood pressure is what it is at the time. Now your ICP is higher. Your CPP ends up being lower. 
So in other words, the higher the ICP, I mean, if we hold blood pressure constant, if we hold blood pressure constant, then the higher the ICP, the less perfusion we're getting to brain tissue. And that makes sense if we look at our PowerPoint. If we raise up fluid, if this is filled with fluid or there's blood hemorrhaging in and pressing on brain tissue, ICP is up, do you think the new blood coming in is going to perfuse tissues evenly and thoroughly? The answer is, of course, no. So if ICP goes up, CPP will end up going down, assuming blood pressure stays constant. But let's just play with that equation a little bit more. Let's say, let's take an example that you all can relate to. It's an example that you would have seen out in your previous clinical settings or in previous case studies of this. Let's take the example that ICP is not an issue. Let's take, let's take it back to another, let's just work with MAP for a bit. Let's say ICP is zero, there's no head injury. But the guy is dehydrated. So the blood pressure is like 80 over 50. Well now, if you run those numbers through MAP, 80 over 50 blood pressure is gonna give you a low MAP. Of course, that's gonna give you a low CPP. You already knew that because you're coming to your instructor saying, hey, my patient with low blood pressure is really drowsy. That's because you may not have put it in this language, but what was happening was a low MAP equals a low CPP. So you've got these three things working off of each other. And you can kind of read what I just said. It's kind of summarized in here. Okay, let's look at some examples here for six. What should the medical team do for each of the following cases? CPP is too low and ICP is normal. Well, if CPP is too low, in other words, they're not getting enough perfusion to the brain and ICP is normal, probably what we're needing to do is raise up MAP. It's the only option. So they might need a bolus or something. Let's see if that's the correct answer, 6A. Raise up MAP, give IV fluids. Correct. CPP is too low. Perfusion to the brain is not adequate. And ICP is too high. Well, theoretically speaking, if ICP is high and this is too low, mathematically speaking, you could raise up MAP. That would make this go higher, but you do not want to do that because raising up MAP would in turn cause ICP to rise as well. It's a really unhealthy, vicious cycle. So if ICP is too high, we need to address the issue of the ICP, lower the ICP, and then mathematically, CPP will go back up. How do we lower ICP? That could be surgery to drain blood and fluid out of the brain. Let's see if that's the correct answer, 6B. It is. Okay, and finally, the question seven. So if CPP is too high, which response makes the most sense? So now they're getting too much perfusion to the brain. Of course, this could be causing, you know, you could be risking hemorrhage, for example. You know that when you've had patients with systolic blood pressures of 180, you go, um, this is not good. Patients got blurry vision, they got a headache, and they're running the risk of, you know, possibly having a hemorrhage here. Uh, so what makes the most sense? If CPP is too high, do we raise ICP to lower CPP? Mathematically, in pure math, it makes sense. If CPP is too high, sure, raise this one up and it will lower that. But in terms of medically speaking, you'd never seek to raise ICP. So that one definitely doesn't make sense. Not going to pick that one. What are the other choices? Lower MAP to lower CPP. That's probably our best choice. So if CPP is too high, we need to find a way of lowering the blood pressure. We're not gonna to seek to raise it up, we'll lower the blood pressure to make the math work. Let's see if that was the right answer for seven, seven B. And it is, we never seek to raise ICP. B is correct, lower the blood pressure. 